Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 11th, 2017, and my guest is author and journalist Megan McArdle. She writes regularly for Bloomberg View. She's the author of The Upside of Down, which we talked about on Econ Talk in April of 2014. Today we're going to be discussing internet shaming, uh, the power of groups and related topics based on a piece that Megan wrote for Bloomberg View that we'll put a link up to. Megan, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. As you point out at the beginning of your piece, people have always said and done embarrassing things that live on and hurt their reputation. The internet seems to make it different, though. How? Well, it's the scale, right? I mean, you see this in business all the time, the scaling problems, is that things that work very well at a small level don't work so well when you try to make them bigger. And the example I always give is trying to agree on where to have lunch, right? Let's say you want to have lunch with three friends. Okay, you get an email thread. Maybe it takes a little bit of time, but eventually you're going to find somewhere that you're going to agree to meet for lunch, pick a time, and that's going to be easy. Well, if you have 200 friends, that's not a very good way to do it. Once you get a certain number of people, you need someone to pick when the lunch is and arrange it. You don't just say, hey, guys, where would you like to eat and when would be good because you will never get that problem solved. Um. Internet shaming is a lot like community shaming, right? It's a, I, I, it's a little bit like a small town. My mother, who grew up in a small town, said, you know, you always felt that you could go behind the, the window, close the shades, and sneeze, and the next day someone would ask you how your cold was. <laughs> um, and it, it, there's always been a lot of prying. There have been people whose lives were wrecked because they did something um, embarrassing in their small town, and everyone knew about it, and no one ever forgets. I still remember being at my grandmother, at church with my grandmother and hearing two women say something like, well, did you see Lillian last night? And the other one said, well, yeah, well, you know how, how, how her people are. You remember when her grandmother (laughs) is just right. So, I mean, there, there's always been these long memories. There's always been these punishments that are handed out to people who kind of defy community norms. But the difference is that, look, if you got in big trouble in your local town or city, at the last resort, you could move. You could go to another city. You could start over. And people did. I mean, you know, this is the, the it's a, an old joke in novels is the only thing that you could do is, is change your name, move away, and hope to live it down. But people actually did that. That was a, a, a way of getting away from the mistakes of your past. And if you look at the internet now, First of all, just the number, and also I should say the ease. It's not just scale. It's also the kind of transaction cost of of shaming and punishing someone, right? It is really cheap on Twitter to get on Twitter and say someone should be fired. It takes you three seconds of time. It's enjoyable. You show the right moral character for all of your friends who are watching you, um, and then you go on with your day. In a, even in a small town, right, to gossip about someone required standing around and talking to your friends. And then you took the risk that there would be retaliation because those people knew who you were and, and could get back at you. You took the, you knew that there was a risk that it could happen to you. You're, in, you're kind of embedded in a social network. On the scale that we have now, there's one internet. There's nowhere to move away from it. You know, where does uh, Justine Sacco, who was the person who tweeted a tasteless joke about AIDS, but was, you know, obviously the kind of thing that people say in an off moment with friends, they make tasteless jokes, their friends roll their eyes or give them a look and they were like, sorry, just kidding. Um, But she unfortunately made it on Twitter. Somehow it escaped from what was a relatively small follower Twitter account. It went viral and she was on a plane when she made it. And so by the time she landed, she'd been fired, right? She was on a long flight to South Africa, I believe. Um, where does James Damore, who wrote the Google memo, where does he go to get away from, this is going to follow him every time he goes to get a job and employer is going to Google him and this is going to come up every time he goes on a date, (laughs) his date is going to Google him and this is going to come up. You can't, you can't escape it and it's forever. 
right? You know, people used to say if the New York Times wrote something about you that may tr- maybe it turned out not to be true, right? The New York Times made a mistake. They identified you as some sort of terrible person. Well, 10 years later, 20 years later, who was going to remember that? Well, now thanks to Google, everyone remembers it. And so you have this immense po- power to wreck lives that didn't exist 20 years ago. Partly because if you look at the Dahmer memo in particular, right, 20 years ago, if you had wanted to even get that story out there in the first place, who was going to write a story about a non-managerial guy at a tech company? He not famous. A big company, not right? a He's celebrity. not famous, had no power over HR. He's just a normal engineer. Say you had gone to a reporter, the reporter would have been like, I'm sorry, I don't really understand what the story is. <laughs> like some of his There's fellow in there. Yeah. It seemed to be mad at him but I can't spend money to print that on paper. Well, in the internet era, you know, the cost of printing things is cheap. You have all of these online online outlets who have gotten rid of their expensive reporting. They've gotten rid of their expensive layers of editing. And so you have enormous numbers of people who are just desperate for any copies. So someone comes to them and says, look at this thing that's going on in Google. There is an economy on the supply side of people just looking for reasons to be outraged. I see it. Everyone sees it, right? It seems to me that in in a lot of ways, the primary reason to go onto news media or social media right now is to find a reason to be mad. Um, And so, of course, they took it. Of course, they ran with it. The actual cost to them of, of putting that up there is very little. They got a ton of clicks out of it. They sold ads against those clicks. Um, and so you have this economy that is has replicated that small town. But first of all, without the mercy that those small towns have, because yes, they did wreck people's lives. Yes, it could be stultifying and all the rest of it. But they also took care of people when they were sick. They also felt bad about seeing the wreckage of someone's life and could ex- and would say, yeah, maybe it's time to forgive him. There's none of that on the internet. It's all of the bad things we hated about small town life and none of the good things that made small town life rewarding. It's a really bad equilibrium that I really think we need to look at what do we do about this? Because no one likes it. Even the people who are in it at the moment, even the people who are calling people out, you know, as the, uh, the, the Stalinists found out with the purges, you could be the next person purged. Everyone is afraid. Everyone's worried about the call out culture, even as they per- participate in it. Um, and it just seems like it's a really bad and unhealthy way for us to be living. And we need to think about how do we rein this in? Because no one likes it and it's, it's quite destructive. So I'm very sympathetic to the basic point and listeners have heard me talk about Twitter. Uh, as you say, we're, we're both you and I are active on it anyway. Um, although I, I follow you. What? I follow you. I follow you. So <laughs> one could argue, uh, you know, the way to deal with this is the way I deal with it occasionally. I've mentioned I, I took Twitter off my phone. It doesn't always last, but I took it off my phone. Uh, that's really more for mindless to avoid mindless just sort of scrolling uh, instead of thinking about something more seriously or in engaging with human beings. But uh, some of it is also just uh, I think of it as the corrosive aspect on my soul or however you want a th- person might want to think about it. Just uh, some of the the attitudes aren't aren't so good for us, and and I th- or I don't like the, what they do to me or make the way they make me feel. And you really got. You know, speaking as the uh, the economist of the conversation, you said outrage is really cheap. I think that's the right. Or you said something like that. I think that's the right way to think about it. But it raises a question before we get into the rest of your essay. Raise the question: Why cheaply expressed outrage has such power? I hadn't really thought about this. Um, certainly, uh, many of the people we're talking about. Uh, there's so many examples. I almost feel like we shouldn't mention them actually because they don't—they don't need any more publicity than they already have. <laughs> uh, but like, like econ talks get and push the numbers over the top, right? Uh, really make it bad for these people. But some of these people, they—they they, they had a hard time. The the question is, one could ask is why? Why would maybe the problem is not so much the internet uh, as it is that a company would fire someone for making a bad joke? Some a company would fire someone for a memo that, when I read it, I was shocked at how thoughtful it was. It's it's not what I expected to be the kind of memo at Google that would get somebody fired. Um, I've talked to some 
friends of mine at Google, and um, they actually describe. And I want to. I want to bring this up. We'll get. Maybe we'll get back. I think we will get back to this later. But James James Damore has appeared often, sometimes I don't know how often, but he wears a shirt that says Gulag on the front, G O O L A G, in Google's font and and colors, and. In a way, there's something obscene about that to compare Google to a Soviet labor camp where people died regularly just from not having good enough clothing for the weather they were in or enough food to keep them alive. Plus, there was actual murder. Um, so there's something obscene about that. And at the same time, and I, I've never spoken to him directly, but other Google people have told me that it's like a Soviet reeducation system. That there's an intolerance, an authoritarianism, a and of course they won't say this publicly because they don't want to have the shaming and and they don't want to be fired. But it's a it's an incredible thing that that that's the case and and it raises the question: Why? How did that happen? How is it that I think of it as just a variation on political correctness? How is it that the perception? That something has been said that is or written that's inappropriate lead to being fired as opposed to real malfeasance, right? Uh, harming other people, destroying com- company property, um, letting le- letting secrets out into the into the world, being careless with confidential information. Those are things that used to get you fired, right? Not do your job well. Now expressing an opinion gets you fired. Now, of course, I think that's also a part of the coming from the internet. So, why, why don't you react to that? Well, let me. I mean, let me see if I can. I can mount the defense. Right. One of the things I love about you is that you're always charitable to the other side and try to make an intellectually honest sort of the case for the the people you disagree with. And let me try to do that with Google. Is first of all, look, angering your fellow employees has always been a firing offense. <laughs> Yep. It's always been right. You know, companies, they're not there to make a big statement about free speech and the values. They're there to do a job. And if you are making it difficult, if you have angered enough of your fellow employees and made it difficult for them to work with you, well, then you're probably not going to be working in that company for a long time. And that's fair. Right. That's just the that's those are the, the rules of the game. Those, those are the that, rules that's, of the game. That's understood. Right. But it's also that, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to have companies that are, you know, we have we have universities that are supposed to be the places for free inquiry. Now we can ask about – I like about, the phrase <laughs> supposed to be in there. Yeah. Yeah, we can ask about how well they're doing these days. But that's, you know, that is part of their institutional makeup. That's not Google's institutional makeup is to just fearless inquiry into the state of the universe. They do a specific thing. They have a specific culture. Add on top of that, look, Google is under pressure from regulators because they don't employ that many women. And that, and, you know, if there are lawsuits, uh, which I believe there are, that memo was going to be list brought up in the lawsuit. Yeah. Right. And, and if they didn't do anything about it, that was going to put them in a weak position with regulators. And again, Google fundamentally first has to make sure the company is still running. Um, and so, yeah, they fired him. But I think that in, – and so making those defenses, right, they have a right to. They're, you and I are both free market people, and companies can fire you because they don't like the way you cut your hair. I think that would be kind of dumb for a company to do, but it's, it's within their rights. Um, that said, I think that begs the question a little bit, right, which is that you can say, well, he created a situation where Google had to fire him, and, and I think that that's true, but let's look about at the environment in which that situation required firing. Right. And that is, I think, what we're both talking about yeah. is that it's not so much that they fired him because he created a problem for them. It's that why was he a problem for them? And that, I think, is the million dollar question. How did we get to the point? And I, I wrote in the essay and, you know, you talk about the, the gulag and the Soviets. Well, yes, I do not want to morally equate um, this kind of shaming and fear to what happened in Soviet Russia. Because in Soviet Russia, people were actually in fear for their lives often, right? I mean, there's rightfully so. Rightfully so. Um, I mean, well, <laughs> let me let me take that back. I do not think that the Soviet government was right in making them no, fear for their no, lives. No, no. But I didn't take they, it that they, way. They were correctly in fear of their lives. Let yeah, us say they, their perception was accurate. Yes. Um, 
I'm having more and more conversations that sound like conversations that I have had with people from former Soviet com- countries. And from my readings, I've been reading more about life in the Soviet Union, where people say, well, start by saying, well, of course, I would never say this in public. And like, you know, 20 years ago, I would never say that in public. This in public was maybe I loved the bell curve. It was Charles Murray's book on IQ, right? Can't say it. There were, there have always been things that you can't say in public for whatever reason. 50 years ago, it was, hey, we should let homosexuals get married, right? Yep. <laughs> that was something you couldn't say in public. We changed that, which is great. Um, but the number of topics seems to be exploding on which I hear this, right? And a lot of them don't seem to be that, you know, it's discussion of abortion, it's discussion of trans rights, it's discussion of all sorts of things that five or 10 years ago you could talk about. Well, it's, more, it's very- so much more than that. I mean, it's discussion of men and women's roles, differences, if any. I mean, this the Google example is a perfect example of that. Um, of course, Larry Summers was fired uh, f- for, for a similar inappropriate remark. When I was in college, right, you know, people on the left, we we felt like we had to argue and go do battle and fight all the time. And there's now this feeling that, like, you don't fight. You just say this person is a racist or they're a misogynist or they're a bigot of some kind. And then the conversation's over and that person's life is should be ruined. Right. And then the ease with which students are now calling for professors to get fired. I mean, I get that they're like 20 and they don't understand that when you're 50, that calling for someone to get fired is just calling to comp- how big a thing they're asking. Right. They, I think that they don't understand that when they routinely ask for people to get sacked from their jobs. Um, but at the same time, there is the sense of like, instead of focusing on, on, grievances and how to repair those grievances. A lot of these grievances have to do with the people instead of things that you should do, right? They have to do with destroying the bad person. Um, and again, I think that is a, a, a thing you see a lot in a small town, you see a lot in, in sort of small band communities. Um, but again, people in those small band communities, there's also a human connection that kind of mitigates how far they're willing to go to destroy someone. And we've pulled that part of it out. And so I think it is a cultural shift. But I think that that cultural shift is combined with a with a technology and that both of those two things are kind of heterodyning each other into something that feels unhealthy for everyone. And the part that I find um, deeply disturbing, and I'm trying to write an essay on this at Medium, and I'll put a link up to it at this story if I remember um, and if I finish the essay. But I, I feel like... And again, I'm not sure this is an internet phenomenon. I think the internet amplifies it. There's a, a people have always been intolerant. Um, people disdain is a very um, can be a very uh, attractive emotion, seductive emotion. Uh, hate can be tragically a seductive emotion, and the willingness to categorize people who don't see the world the way I do as not just disagreeing with me, but worthy of contempt, dishonor, and uh, exile, which is really in a way what we're talking about here, right? Firing someone is like saying, this this person belongs in the wilderness. <laughs> they're not worthy. It's not just they're not worthy of a second chance when someone makes an offhand remark that gets, say, misinterpreted or was a mistake. Uh, their worldview is dangerous, and therefore I am justified in – vilifying them and wanting to push them into into exile. And that is what I find it's not really the it's not your the point of your essay, but it's a very related point for me. It's the ease with which people are willing to dismiss other human beings as unworthy. And that is I think a really strikes at the fabric of civilization. It certainly strikes it at our common our day-to-day interactions culturally and socially, and uh, we have we're in an, we're in a moment in American history where there aren't a lot of feedback loops that tamp that down. Rather, there's a bunch that expand it, and the internet's one of those, right? 
where, where you can safely gang up on someone as being unworthy? Yeah, you, you said two words uh, that I think are important, one of which I will tweak and one of which I will just enthusiastically agree with. And the first is you said unworthy. And I think actually the word I would use is worthless. Yeah, even better. Right, is that these people have no worth at all, that anything can be done to them this is how people used to talk about criminals. And thankfully, I think that conversation has, sh- has shifted a little bit. Even conservatives are starting to talk about rehabilitation and the fact that this is a human being and who may have done something terrible, but who we would not like, you know, every, every life is a universe, right? When someone dies, a universe ends. And that when you, it doesn't matter what that person has done, we should care about the fact that there is a universe between that person's head and we should save that universe if we can for as long as we can. Right. And, but we've shifted it now to our political opponents where there's this sense that, you know, that if they disagree with me on, on big fundamental issues, they should just be destroyed. Well, it's not Not, just big ones. Yeah. It's any (laughs) small ones. No, I'm serious. It's really because they all go together, right? You've got this, uh, this idea that, you know, if, well, if you're, if you feel this way about this, then obviously you're going to feel this way about that. And of course, sometimes that's true. And therefore, I don't even need to explore the rest of your world, but you're one of them. And yeah. I think that's despicable. That's a sad, okay. sad thing. And that goes with the other word you said, which is exile. Yeah. And this is really, I think, where things have shifted, where there is no longer simply this sense that, no, again, we've always used exile for. The journalism has always used exile, for example, for, for, plagiarists. You know, yeah. for plagiarists. If if you even plagiarists have gotten away with it, there are still some people plagiarists working. Uh, the one thing you absolutely never, ever, ever could do was make up a story. Yep, that was it. You would never work in journalism again. Um, if you you know you you can get details wrong. We've all unfortunately done that. Whether you misspell someone's name or but if it, if there was any evidence that there was, it was malfeasant that you had just fabricated yep. something. That's, it's over, right? Every community has these things. Lawyers have their canon. The, the, you cross that line and you're out. But those, that, those offenses used to be like a small number of things, and they're growing to be a large number well, of they're things. They're also well delineated. Everybody knows what it means to make up a story. To be a sexist or racist, the expansion of those categories um, is what I find uh, alarming. Um, and it, I, I don't know why exactly it's happening. Obviously, that's and it's not maybe so interesting to speculate. I, I want to talk for a minute, though, about how you and I, who write publicly and talk publicly as we're doing now, might respond to this. So one of the th- things I've already learned from our conversation today is the number – it made me re- realize how many times I say to someone, you're the only person I can say this to. <laughs> and it's and I mean usually other than my wife. Uh, what I mean is in public, right? I have yeah. I have a couple of friends who I know will not vilify me if I concede I believe X, Y, or Z. Uh, but it's weird that I have to say that, and I mean it too. There, there, there are a lot of things that can't be said. So one reaction to this, um, which. Is not my first thought, but it's an interesting one perhaps, is to say I'm not going to let the internet shaming mob cow me. I am not going to be – I'm going to bear the price. I'm going to face the consequences, knowing that they're there, of saying things that are politically incorrect or socially unacceptable if indeed I think they they might be true and I might qualify them, knowing that, of course, qualification doesn't help. But saying I'm not sure but – uh, uh, doesn't really help. You still you're going to get attacked. Uh, so that's one response. You recently wrote, for example, I think I don't know where you did it. I saw this on Twitter. You had the temerity and the gall and the courage to say that there could be benefits from climate change, even though it's maybe the case that the costs will do, will you know mam, mam, massively outweigh and overwhelm yes. the benefits, but that there could be benefits. And talk about the reaction to that, and, and what do you think of this idea of, of just sort of speaking truth as you see it, even though you know you're going to bear a cost? Because you bore a cost for that. I did. <laughs> Actually, I tweeted this a long time ago, but it's something I've, I've often thought, right, is that you read stories on climate change, and it's inevitably just a litany of all of the horrific things that are going to happen. 
right? And I look, I, I should put my cards on the table. Uh, I believe in anthropogenic global warming. Um, I think that because there are feedback loops that are poorly understood, I don't want to mess with the only climate we have. I don't want to run a one-way experiment we can't take back uh, on a single system that I need to survive. Um, and because of that, you know, I have some sympathy with people like Matt Ridley, who are lukewarmists, they call themselves, yep. who think it's happening, just don't think it's going to be a big deal. Um, there aren't that many kind of true, like, this just isn't happening. This is all a big lie. They're in the kind of skeptic community. They're mostly lukewarmists at this point. Um, I have sympathy for them and I read them, but I also think I want an insurance policy. And so I think we should have a carbon tax. I think we should be funding at the government level, hog wild research into renewable sources of power and low carbon sources of power. I just, I feel pretty strongly about this. That said, I'm also kind of not in the full climate camp and I get a lot of pushback from them because I, I don't simply say, well, therefore I'm just going to do the litany of horrors. But I do this with, you know, when I write about the minimum wage, right? Now, I don't think the minimum wage should be $15 an hour. When I write about it, I have to acknowledge there are some people who are getting more money because of this. Maybe they're not the people we're trying to target. Maybe they're affluent teenagers or people who retirees who are pretty skilled, who went back into the workforce uh, because they enjoy kind of getting out of the house. Um, but that said, those people are going to benefit. And you don't write a piece about uh, the minimum wage and just say it's all cost, no benefit. I think there's a disemployment effect. I think people lose jobs and that those people are usually the most vulnerable people that we want to help. Um, but that said, there are costs and there are benefits and you kind of have to acknowledge both sides of the ledger. And you don't see that in climate change writing. You just very rarely do. It's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's in the IPCC report. You can see they do, it's not that scientists don't try to do the net. Um, it's that the way it gets reported is this kind of litany of just terrible, 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 terrible. And so I said, I would like to see a, a good climate environmental journalist just do a piece on, or, or mention even in another piece. What are the what are the actual net upsides? Which places are going to benefit from this? Because I presume some of them will. Which is not to say we shouldn't do something about climate change any more than it is to say that when I say some people benefit from the minimum wage, now I want a twenty dollar an hour minimum wage. I don't, but I acknowledge trade offs. And the reaction to this was just a bunch of people tweeting, "Ha ha! Maybe we should do articles on drinking bleach." I got a bunch of it. Maybe we should do articles on how great the Holocaust was. It was like. You know, yeah, the Nazis made the trains <laughs> ran on time, and that was good for you know that was good for whatever people yeah, learned and, about timetables, right? About how to run well, a train system. And yeah, the Holocaust and global warming are kind of morally not in the same category. Not to me. Now, in fact, not medical, to me and you, but to some right. people, it is. That's the, what we're talking about. But everything seems to be in that category, yeah. right? Correct. That's the is the increasing number of things where the first go to of people is like. Why don't you talk about how great the Holocaust was if you're going to say this? Well, you know, the right. Holocaust was really a kind of uniquely terrible. It wasn't as large as the communist death toll, but it was worse in a lot of ways because it was so organized and it was organized against a particular group of people. And there's a right. I mean, we don't have to get into why the Holocaust was bad. I think we all agree it can, was. You can. Yeah, we can take that as written. Um, but it's really like a unique moral horror in the history of humanity. Um, and to equate everything to that, well, if everything's the Holocaust, we now just don't have any more language to talk about anything lesser. And also people don't actually, it, it, it works against your cause in the end. And I, I really do think this is well, that, that's the other part of this because it, it, in, it, yeah, it infuriates people and, and causes them to resent being called Nazis, for example, or, or being presumed to be the equivalent of a Nazi, and that pushes those people, not Meghan McArdle perhaps, thank goodness, but some people to then say, well, I need to respond with as much vehemence, vitriol, and um, vituperation as, as you accused me. And But I want to come back to the point yeah. – I want to come back to the point of did you do that with some trepidation? Were you – or was that fun for you? What was <laughs> – and do you think we should do more of that to try to open this – some of these topics up for conversation? You know, I think 
15 years ago when I started doing this, I enjoyed getting a rise out of people more. And now it just makes me tired. Yeah, the thrill is gone. Um, in part because, like, it's gotten quite predictable. And I should say, like, that wasn't a dangerous thing for me to say. I never thought, like, I could get fired if I write this. So this is not, you know, was, but you could I could get people making fun of me, you which is true. But and, well, Bloomberg is not going to fire me because, uh, because I suggested that climate change might occasionally have some upsides and we should know what they are. Bloomberg's a pretty good place about, you know, opening query and <laughs> looking into, you know, this is fundamentally like we do a lot of technocratic stuff and that's a technocratic question. Um, is what are the trade-offs here and what are the policy trade-offs of, of, of doing stuff. I write about that all the time. Um, but now I, you know, it's not fun to engage with people who are so angry. You know, I, I think about this with my trolls all the time because I have people who are quite dedicated to trolling me. Uh, mostly I meet them on Twitter. Yep. Me too. Uh, you know, I don't even block them because blocking them is an engagement where then they know they've been blocked and they get angry. It's like, they're, they're still talking to me. I just don't hear them. Um, but, you know, I'm not that interesting, (laughs) but like this kind of personal rage at me, this personal hatred for me, um, you know, you should have something better in your life than that. And I, I mean, and I, I think that a lot about a lot of these things is you should have something better in your life than hating another human being. Well, who you don't know, who you don't know. And you, you know. I, I, I'm down on hatred in general. I don't think I hate anyone that I've ever known. Um, and because, you know, we have what, 70, 80 years. It's like, it, you know, I'm in middle, I'm in middle age now and it's such a pitifully short period of time and to waste any of it, you know, anger is different. Anger is a natural response to things that are often outrageous, but hate this, this wishing someone ill this wishing terrible things for another human being. Um, it's, it's just, it's destructive. It plays no good role and it is chewing up precious seconds of your life that could be better dedicated just for you. Forget the person you're hating, right? Just for you, it could be better dedicated to something else. And I think that that is kind of the other cultural thing, the thread that we're talking here is that we seem to be extraordinarily angry all the time. We seem to hate a whole lot of stuff. And I, you know, I, I think about the Trump election, right? And I was, pretty critical of Trump. I was pretty critical of, of Hillary Clinton too, um, for what I think were good and sound reasons. And, and I said, you know, at one point I, I got into this debate with my readers, many of whom were, were Trump voters. And they said all of these things about bad things that they thought the other side had done to them. And I was like, look, we, you know, I agree with a lot of this. We, there were, there were people, the elites kind of abused their power in a lot of ways They've been contemptuous of you, all of those things. That said, here is a not a good argument, right? Well, my new fiance steals from me and she's a drug addict and she hates my kids and sometimes she hits me, but boy, my ex-wife hates her. Like that's <laughs> not a good reason to get married. Yeah. Right? Or and, or even I, I think the simpler point, and I, I I'm up on a really fragile soapbox here, but I think the idea of of responding to contempt with contempt is not a healthy thing, and I think it's a human thing. I get the I get the desire for it. Um, I, I, so I want to force you back to this topic of this question: of what you should do about it? Should you? I, I agree with you. It's no fun to get hate mail that, that wishes you ill or death, uh, and and that's really unpleasant. Um, and I think those of us who are on and, you know, I'm not very much in the public eye, but to the extent I am, I get those and I, I try not to let them get to me. They usually don't, but they still – sometimes they do. Should I fight back against that urge to hide and say what I feel even when I know it's going to generate a lot of antagonism and possibly um, lead to people um, I mean, be putting – becoming a pariah, which is a phrase you use in the – in the piece, I think it's really the the right phrase. It's a word that hardly ever gets, you know, it's almost gone out of fashion to be a pariah. Just, you know, it means socially uh, unacceptable. It means, again, unworthy 
or worth less, uh, even a little bit dangerous perhaps, a pariah is someone who has to be pushed out of the camp. Um, do you think we should just be ourselves? Um, no, I think there's a number of questions there. I mean, first is obviously you're kind of, I'm not going to tell anyone that they have to stand up and immolate their career for the sake of, of ending this. I will admire people who do, but realistically, like people have mortgages to pay and, and, and so forth. So like I, I'm fighting against it as best I know how, which is trying to do it somewhat kindly. And there's this great quote from a rabbi whose name now escapes me because I'm in middle age. Um, <laughs> That he said, when I was young, I admired people who were clever. And now that I'm old, I admire people who are kind. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's really true. Uh, clever is easy. Kind is hard. And kind is, I think, more effective. I'm teaching a class at Duke this semester on persuasive writing. And the, the thing that I am over, more than anything going to try to drum into my students' heads is that the minute you are clever and mean and outrageous, you've lost someone. That's it. They will never listen to you. The minute you're sarcastic to them, the minute, and like, it's fun. I get it. So fun. Like, right. I love being sarcastic because I'm good at it. And we all love things we're good at. Yep. And I've basically stopped. I, I don't always stop. I, I, I have the occasional column where I, I kind of let it all hang out, but I try to really minimize those columns because they are fun to write and they're fun to read. If you already agree with me and anyone who doesn't, just turns off and doesn't listen to a darn thing I say. And so I think, you know, the kind of, well, I'm just going to go out and say whatever I think and just shock people. And I'm not going to pay attention to those people. I think it's understandable because again, when the, when the categories shift, not just to so many, but so rapidly, right? Like things that everyone, a majority of the population believed five years ago, go, are now things that brand you uh, just a, a moral horror, How right? About, you know, like, like being a football fan well, uh, is, is on the verge of that, I have a feeling, right? Yeah, and I, like, I, I actually, like, I am one of the people who thinks, yeah, I don't have kids, but if I did, I wouldn't let a boy play football. Um, and I think that there is something, I, I enjoy watching it, but I also understand, like, what's happening inside those guys' brains. Like, they're, they're consenting adults, but I don't have to watch everything consenting adults choose to do to themselves for money uh, or for the love of victory or for whatever, any other reason. And I, I can't watch it um, because it's, it's tragic. With, so I'm uneasy it. about it now. Uh, I'm not sure that the scientific evidence is open and shut, but there is some clearly. And um, I'm just raising the question. Yeah. Things that appear to be totally normal in short order may turn out to be Socially unacceptable soon. Yeah, which and I is think weird. That that's not. I think that's not possible to maintain. And again, I you know I talked about the Soviet. <laughs> that's what it felt like, and and not in the early kind of purge days. Although there was a lot of that, I remember having a weird debate with a Russian office mate at a summer internship when I was in business school. And he was he was first of all like all the Russians I knew in the United States pre, prior to that, and I'd known a lot, but they were all Jews because there had been this huge. Exodus, Exodus yeah. of Jewish people from the Soviet Union. He was the first ethnic Russian I'd ever met. And it was interesting to me because he had very different attitudes from the previous Russians I'd known. And he said to me, he was basically defending the idea that we should be able to say, race, make racist and sexist jokes. And I was very upset by this. Yeah, <laughs> I was, sure. you know, it was late in the night. And, I was, and he said, look, you know, you've got the wrong idea about the Soviet Union. Under Brezhnev, the risk wasn't that you were going to get sent to a camp. The risk was you lose your job in your apartment and then no one would want to talk to you because they knew it was dangerous to talk to you because they might lose their job in their apartment. And I, again, I don't want to draw too much moral equivalence. And I also want to actually stand firm. You should not tell racist jokes. And if yep. people do tell racist jokes, you should tell them that's not okay. And don't laugh um, at them. And you shouldn't, you definitely shouldn't laugh at them, but you should also just like the, there is a good st social stigma on racist jokes and we should maintain that social stigma. Uh, I haven't changed my mind about that. But that has stuck with me as an example of something that I hadn't understood before. And that I think that this is the kind of soft fear, right, that um, – and he said – his example was you told a joke about Brezhnev, you wouldn't get shot, but you might lose your apartment. And as things – as these categories widen, we're pulling in more and more stuff that there's no social consensus that should be banned, right? And so it's it's very similar to that, is that there's 
people who are now feeling afraid because they might say something that isn't just telling a terrible racist joke, but suggesting that maybe women and men have different interests and are not going to be equally represented at tech companies. And that even some of those interests might be genetic. Um, And this is something that I'm a woman. I'm in a pretty male field. I've always done pretty male jobs. And it doesn't in any way offend me. If it's true, it's true. The universe isn't here to please me. Right. And as you pull those things in, um, you create this climate of everyone feeling like they have to lie in public. And what's interesting to me about reading those Soviet those Soviet era things is how many people Orwell talks about this, Vasov Havel talks about this, is the feeling that making you tell a lie is the point. That there's no like greater point of what you're saying except that they have they have undermined your character by forcing you to lie for the regime. Is that they're they're making you weaker. And that people under Soviet regimes really do seem to feel that that's true. I don't know if it is true, but they, they do seem to feel that that is the case. Funny. And so to go, but to go back to, you know, so just outraging people, there's a reason that the people who do that are people like Milo, right? And you get, I don't want to outrage anyone. I don't want to well, make that's people not unhappy. What I'm, that's not what I meant. But I, no, I, no, I, but I, there, there's a real, there's a real thing of that. And that's one of the things that restrains people, even if you are, you're worried about this and you want to just have a non-confrontational, non-outrageous, non-nasty public conversation about things that matter, right? It matters whether women have different interests and that there's a genetic component because that's going to tell us are companies discriminating. That's how you assess whether companies are discriminating, right? Is you can see what the end result is. Well, if there's a plausible end result that isn't discrimination, you've got to take that into effect, into account Uh, when you you assess this. I think there's a much more important reason to take that seriously, and that's that how we raise our children and our really it's ironic because you know we've been talking about the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was based on an ideology, part of which was about the fact that human beings are infinitely malleable, and we just need to um, make them whatever we want them to be. And I think that's the road to the the real gulag, and I I see us taking steps down that road in in mistaking, potentially, I'm open to the possibility that maybe men and women really are the same. I I don't think they are. Well, we know they're not physically the same, but whether anything beyond that is important is, is a legitimate scientific question, and if it's off the table to treat it as a legitimate scientific question, we will do a bad job raising our children. We will do a bad job creating our, – making our choices and um, – We'll do a bad job creating a society yeah. in which both groups of people flourish, are going to be happy. Can right? flourish, yeah. That, that's the issue for me and I don't I, – I, I think it's hugely um, hugely important. Before we, before we go on, I, I want to I challenge one thing uh, at the root of your concerns and then I want to talk about some – some of what I think we can do about it, uh, and then you can suggest whether you agree or what your own ideas are. But the thing I want to I want to raise is some would argue, perhaps legitimately, I don't agree, but I'm not sure how I feel about this actually, that shaming is good, that all of this stuff that you're worried about, yes, people are scared about what they say. Well, they should be scared, goes this argument, because words can hurt people, words are important. And it's really a, – it's a glorious thing that we have made people sensitized about the harmful effects of their words. And the things that you're decrying, Megan, are actually good. Uh, and one extreme version of this would be – and this is uh, – this drives me crazy, but I will put it forward anyway. Uh, well, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing uh, – if you don't say anything bad, there's nothing – you're not going to get hurt. All the, all the shaming is is to punish people who tell uh, disgusting jokes, write grotesque memos that say things at the water cooler that are that intimidate and and harm people, and those people should be shamed. So I think that that is actually true up to a point. I've I've made this point before. In fact, my first column I ever wrote on online shaming, which was based on John Ronson's excellent book on the topic, which everyone should read. Uh, in which I coined the term shame storming, which sadly failed to catch on, uh, denying internet surprised. meme it's a great uh, name. immortality. 
Uh, yeah, somehow I, I try to coin these things periodically as all writers do, and mine never catch on. Mm. Julian Sanchez, on the other hand, like just tosses them offhand, and they're always uh, amazingly, you know, apt and meme-y. Um, but yeah, look, when people tell racist jokes and their friends turn around and say, that's not funny, you shouldn't, that's, you shouldn't say that, right? That's useful. Completely useful. It's how society evolves. It's Those how the society norms. It has to happen. Those there are the is Smithian no society. Norms of judgment and and people's desire to be lovely and and to be respected by their friends that restrains constrains behavior. It's great. There is no society that gets along without that. Um, that's not what we're doing at this point, though, right? We're not just look. I have been on the internet for fifteen years. I have said some things I should not have said. Uh, and gotten people screeching at me, uh, justifiably, right? I have had, and then sometimes not justifiably, I have had pictures of my house emailed to me with a gun sight over the house. I have had death threats. I have had all of this stuff, right? That you shouldn't send death threats to people. You should not make even photographic kind of pseudo death threats. Yeah. Um, but I get, you know, I hope you and your family die. I hope, et cetera, et cetera. I get that all the time. And some of it is productive. Some of it is not. Um, but that's all to me kind of all in the game. It's terrible. I feel terrible for like this, that girl at Yale who got filmed saying some really intemperate and unwise things to her professor, you know, sort of screaming profanity yeah. at her professor. In um, a moment of emotion. And, yeah. In a moment of, look, she should not have screamed profanity at her professor. I will say that. But I will also say that uh, the internet definitely should not have deluged her with horrible, ugly messages, right? And I've been through it and I know like the first 10 or 20 times it happens to you, it's really terrible. Uh, now it just rolls off my back. I, like, I can't even, you know, this is... That's because that comes with the territory and it doesn't, it shouldn't come with being an 18-year-old in college as a freshman or a junior or senior for the, and having to deal with it out of the blue unexpectedly. Right. Um, it's not right. But it's also a different thing. However terrible it is, right, you, you, you move on. You, you kind of huddle for a few days, you feel bad, you tell all your friends how bad you feel. And then a year later, yeah, it was bad, but you've gotten over it, right? The difference now is, I mean, there's there's a couple things. And one of them has to go to that tweet that you talked about, the global warming tweet. It's like a year old. And periodically it just comes back to life. I don't know how it comes back to life. Someone finds it, someone retweets it, and there's a whole new lever of people screaming at you. And again, for me, this is my job. It's all in the game. You want to scream at me, go right ahead. Um, but that happens to these people who get internet shamed. But more than that, right, there's a lot of economic consequences here. You look at something like Memories Pizza, the the pizza place that told in Indiana that told people they wouldn't do cater gay weddings. Like, what are the odds that a pizza place in a small town in Indiana was actually ever going to be asked to cater a gay wedding? Seemed kind of slight, but the internet went crazy and these people were just deluged with horrible messages. They ultimately had to close down. Then they got a lot of donations, right? There's, so there's two camps and yeah. there can be counter benefits as well. But um, when you're talking about depriving someone of their livelihood, and this goes back to Brezhnev, right? If, if someone told a Brezhnev joke and all of your friends looked over and said, that's not funny, you should not question our, our fearless leader, you know, that would be creepy. Um, maybe you would want to get new friends, but it would be within the kind of bounds of normal human social reaction. The problem is when you're actually afraid, like they're going to take away the means by which I make my living. That is an enormous amount of power. And that was ultimately what I ended up talking about this article, in this article is that classical liberals and libertarians, of which I think you and I are both one, we normally have two categories, private power, which is fine because it's bounded, because there's exit. Um, and then there's public power, which has guns behind it and is not bounded and is a different animal. And that's the animal that we focus on. Yep. Right. Um, and there can be some cases of companies that kind of get so much monopoly power that they start acting like governments, but it's actually pretty rare. Um, this is a third creature that seems to be in between those two things, right? Because it's not one company. This is not a Google. If this guy just got fired from Google, okay, well, you go work for another company that maybe doesn't care so much, right? Where you haven't made your coworkers angry or whatever. Um, all companies are probably going to be afraid to hire this guy. Well, I think I think small companies might take a chance on him if if his skills are such, but it, sure, he's, but he's, he's never going to get a he's damaged. Like gig. He's damaged in a way that was not true ten years ago when it was just you said something bad on the internet and then people screamed at you and you felt bad. 
And sometimes you said, yes, I shouldn't have said that. And sometimes you argued back, but either way, it was bounded. When you threaten someone's economic livelihood, you're, you're threatening pretty close to killing them, right? If you, if you can't make money to survive, then it's, it's not the same as threatening to kill them, but it's probably the next worst thing a government can do is after bodily harm and threat or, or death, what can the state threaten you with? They can take away all of your money. They can take, freeze your bank accounts. They can make it impossible for you to live in society. And that is a thing that this power is starting to approach. I mean, we talk about freezing bank accounts. Uh, Southern Poverty Law Center designated uh, a small kind of religious values institute. They're quite conservative. The head of the institute seems to be Catholic um, and quite traditional Catholic. Um, they were branded a hate group and then their payment provider cut them off. So they couldn't take donations. Um, those kinds of powers, when they're ubiquitous, when it isn't just this happens and then like, you know, my bank didn't want to deal with me because of my views. So I went and got another bank, right? That is a fundamentally different thing from now. All the banks don't want to touch me. Um, so let me put and, it in, let me, let me put it in a different framework. Cause I think this is what I was trying to get at earlier. And, and I think will help us organize our thinking about it. And I want to come back to your point about whether this is something different that we have to deal with. That that it's a and it's really the point of your piece, by the way, which I haven't really focused on yet. Which is that this is a form of coercion. And since as classical liberals, we should be worried about coercion. We should be worried about this. So I just want to I want to rephrase some of the pull together some of the things we've been saying. I think there's a temptation in life to punish things we don't like. And that leads to a – that's not a bad idea uh, on the surface. The bad idea is to say the bigger the punishment, the better because then there will be less of the thing I don't like. And that forgets the fact that that will lead to other behavior. And this to me is a very Coasean – this is one of the things I've learned from the Coase theorem, which – and Coase's article, I should say, on social costs because I think it's just – this insight's very deep and very unappreciated and very unintuitive, which is – if you raise the cost of something, you do get less of it. And if it's something you don't like, you'd say, well, that's good. But you forget the fact that that sets a whole other set of incentives in motion, which is really, I think, what Coase's point was in, in externalities and how if we punish them, we don't just get less of the externality. You get other incentives for behavior. And if you do punish the externality, you get a difference. You get incentives of behavior. And you want to look at the whole picture. And that, I think, is the deepest insight of that article. Um, and I, I'll take the opportunity here just to mention that again, the Coase theorem is not what people usually say it is. And yes. listen to my <laughs> listen to my um, econ talk interview with Ronald Coase and his frustration with that. But I will put a link up to it. But but my point is this: if if you don't think it's a good thing for airlines to lose bags, lose their, your luggage, which everybody agrees that's a bad thing, you don't want a fine of a million dollars for a lost bag because what that means is the Airline, maybe they'll just stop flying uh, for starters, but it certainly means they're going to spend a lot more resources to not lose your bag. And you might say, well, that's great. You forget the fact that someone has to pay for those. That's usually – not usually. It's almost always the customer. And so the customer is going to ha is now being told, I'm not going to lose your bag, but it's going to cost you now the equivalent of an extra $500, say, or $300 or $200 to fly, in which case you'd say, I think I'd rather take a chance. Uh, that you lose the bag and not have to pay that higher price. And when we mandate a million-dollar fine, we're basically saying to the company, you have to be at one end of this trade-off. And that, I think, is the problem with, with what we're talking about. The shaming is generally shaming, as you said. It's a huge part of civilization. Uh, disapproval, uh, the raised eyebrow, the ending a friendship over a, a perhaps tragic but often maybe justified over some horrible misbehavior – that might be the right thing to do in certain situations. But if the punishment for thinking a bad thought and uttering it is exile, uh, joblessness, uh, no longer part of, of socially acceptable society, what you get is what, you, what we came talking about before, which is a lot of people thinking, I better not say much. And you talk about this in your, in your essay. I'll just stick to the weather. And what that does – and you can say, well, that's OK. That way nobody's feelings gets hurt and no, nothing offensive is said. But what it means is that nothing creative is said, nothing innovative is said. It's best to keep your mouth shut, and you lead to, you end up with a culture and a society that is uh, 
a bunch of sheep, a bunch of uh, people with their nose to the, you know, they're trying to stay under the radar all the time from 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 these phenomena. And so that I think is the is the true cost of this. It 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 destroys uh, thoughtful discourse, and thoughtful discourse is what makes civilization. I think that's absolutely right, and I think there's also another cost. Um, you know, Scott Alexander, who runs a great blog, Slate Star Codex, um, yeah. he Amazing. had a great post a while back on something called Mott and Bailey arguments. Basically, the idea is the Mott is your your kind of tower. It is your easily defensible tower, and then the Bailey is the, the broad land around it, uh, which is completely indefensible. And so what people would do back in the medieval era when they is when enemies showed up, they'd all get into the mott, and then as soon as the enemy went away, they'd go back to the bailey and do their farming and so forth. And and the idea of this is you say, okay, and you know, the example he gives is something like privilege, is that you have a kind of bland and unobjectionable definition that no one could disagree with. Um, and then you have a really, really hard to defend um, definition that's more useful. So think about something like misogyny, right? Is If we say everyone's a little bit sexist, which I think is true, right? Like everyone we grew up in, the culture we're in, we have attitudes that we have inherited. Human beings tend to stereotype people just based on their personal experience. Um, you know, that's how our minds work. Something happens. You categorize all of the, the little categories that were associated with that action and you associate whatever happened with those categories. It's just how we learn, um, unfortunately. And you'd leave out a lot of yeah. data that makes your narrative too complicated. That's so unfortunately, we learn some wrong things that way. And but so you have a, a definition of sexism, like everyone's a little bit sexist. There are persistent attitudes towards women in society that hurt women's advancement. Okay, yes, that's. I think most people could agree that that is true, at least in some. Then you get to definitions like merely saying that women and men might be different is misogyny. That's a really hard to defend. Yeah. Uh, right. So what you do is you use these two things interchangeably. Whenever you're challenged, you go back to the mop. <laughs> and whenever you're not challenged, you use, you use the term as if it meant this much broader definition that a lot of people would contest. Um, and so the cost to that though is that eventually people notice. And then, you know, one thing that I've written about in a variety of contexts is if you make the punishment for anything too severe, people don't want to apply it. So if you say being a sexist is really, really bad and that sort of person needs to be exiled, okay, I, we can agree that there are people who should not be managers because they're sexism, right? If you walk in and you look at a woman and you think that woman probably couldn't possibly be bright enough to do any job more advanced than typing, well, you probably shouldn't be a manager. You're going to make bad hiring decisions and you're not going to be very good with your female subordinates. <laughs> um, but there aren't a lot of those people around, um, but if you want to apply the punishment for that, which is, no, you can't be a manager in a, com in a modern company, you want to apply the punishment for that to everyone who maybe thinks that there's um, some differences between men and women on average, not in individual cases. Well, people are going to bulk. And so if you say that sexism is so bad that people who practice it need to be exiled, then people are going to be very, very narrow about the definition they're willing to use of what sexism is. And that actually excludes a lot of things that kind of arguably are sexist, right? Okay. It, it makes it hard to talk about things like structural sexism, family leave policy and all sorts and, and those sorts of things, because precisely because you've established that the penalty for this is social death. Well, I need I need a pretty high, high uh, burden of proof for me to impose social death on someone. And so David Frum talks about his, it talked on a podcast recently about his son going off to college, um, a liberal coming back a conservative because he was so sick of all of the PC stuff. And him having to say to his son, like, no, you shouldn't say those things, right? <laughs> there are some things that shouldn't be said. And the problem is, right, is that if you make everything into something that shouldn't be said, people lose the ability to distinguish the things that they shouldn't say, the things they really shouldn't say. When you yeah, overbroaden it, you you actually lose support for fighting racism, for fighting sexism, for fighting all sorts of bigotry, because you've made it so broad and you've made the penalty so high that yeah. people just throw up their hands and say, "Look, I cannot shun two thirds of the population for one thing or the other. I have to, you know." And that is the where I I'm worried that we're heading is this not just this thing where people are afraid, not just where we're losing a creative, open, expressive society where we can freely discuss ideas. But also that the very goals that the people who are doing this, I think genuinely are trying to 
to advance. They're genuinely trying to improve the world. They're actually going to hurt those goals because they're going to make it harder to convince people. The most effective thing I have ever written in my personal mind, you know, um, was a piece that I did comparing academic bias against conservatives to structural racism. And the academics, as you can imagine, got very upset about this. But what was actually great about that piece was I got a bunch of conservatives who wrote me and said, you know what, I always thought this structural racism stuff was nonsense, and now I understand what they were talking about. <laughs> right? And like that warms my heart every time I think of it, because I believe structural racism is, exists, and I believe it is something that you need, you need attention, and you need to really be thinking about fighting, because it will otherwise operate the way human groups do. Um, and the reason that I was effective was precisely because I didn't say, Letting these things happen makes you the worst person on the planet, and if you don't care about this exactly as much as I do, you deserve social death. I said, look, guys, here's something you care about, and here's why this thing is like that. And you can see they're, they both operate in the same way. They're not morally the same, but they operate by the same mechanism. And you know, put those two things together, you can see how this happens, and suddenly, by talking respectfully to people— by giving them examples that they empathized with. And this goes back to a question you asked me earlier. What do I do? What I try to do, honestly, is be as respectful as I can to say, guys, like we're all good people who want good things for society. And we shouldn't hate each other, but here's some stuff we're doing that I think isn't working. Um, and maybe that's not effective. I don't know. But that is my best guess at what works is not outraging people but just pointing out all of the ways in which this is bad for everyone, not just bad for the people who get shamed, but bad for the rest of us. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my um, solution. I, obviously, I'm putting it in quotes. Um, I'm going to say it differently. I'm going to give you what I'm trying to do personally to try to keep this from spiraling out of control. And, of course, I'm only one person. But each of us, I think, if we take on the, the uh, these norms, uh, we'll reduce the odds of it by some amount. And I really don't care, actually. What the I, I hope it works. I hope it makes a difference. But I think even just for one's own sanity and um, and well being, I think this, this is. I'm hoping this is good advice. So my my strategy, I, I take your point that there's a there's a Social pressure can be very powerful and near coercion. I, I do want to keep it separate from government coercion uh, in terms well. of how I, I think about it, it. So I want to start at least with some social things we might do as individuals that could become eventually more widely viewed as the right thing to do. So I'm going to, I'm going to suggest two things. And I'm, by the way, before I forget, I want to, I'm really glad you mentioned Scott Alexander and Slate Star Codex because – I think he's writing some of the most interesting things on this topic, uh, and I think uh, Jordan Peterson has also influenced my thinking on this because he's suggested that this isn't just like unattractive, but maybe threatening to the to the fabric of civilization. And I, I, I've sort of just been alarmed by it until recently. But reading him made me a little more scared than I've been before, and I think that's probably a good thing. It, it helps me understand why I don't like to read the newspaper. Um, uh, or, or go to news sites these days, I just find it very depressing. And I don't want to be just depressed. I think it's important to, if it's really alarming, abdication from these issues is not acceptable. So uh, the two things that are, Econ Talk listeners will not be surprised, the two things I think we ought to be focusing on are, um, but I got derailed. I was just going to say that I think Scott Alexander's essay on the in-group and the out-group and our ability to what we can tolerate is extremely important. It's one of the best essays I've read in a long time, and I'll put a link up to it, and I'll also do the one on the one you had mentioned, Martin Bailey. Um, but what I was going to say, the two things I would recommend are, one, humility. I think it's incredibly important in today's world to imagine the possibility that you might not be right. You can think that you're right. You can believe that you're right. You can act as if you're right. But you should, in your heart and in your head, realize the possibility that you might not be right and the more you think that, the less likely you are to dehumanize the people who disagree with you. And I think that's the deepest threat to our to our to our daily life right now. The second thing I would recommend is not responding in kind to people who troll you, who who send you ugly emails, etc. 
uh, I've, it, it took me a long, long time, and I may have mentioned this before, but it's, I found it – it's really exhilarating to not come back with that snarky, sarcastic response to the person who uh, says something hateful or, or negative to you. And when you respond, in, not in kind, but respond kindly and with compassion and say, um, well, and just re- and maybe just restate your opinion calmly and, and make it clear that, that, that you feel the way you do, uh, I think that's the right – response and i think it may be naive to think that twitter culture can be changed but there could be another twitter someone could start a twitter that's that is more civilized that is maybe curated filtered maybe it's not a free for all maybe it's a a place where you have to have membership where you have to behave by explicit rules not just the norms that emerge on twitter that are so i think uh, not so attractive and I, i also want to add I've gotten an immense amount from Twitter that is incredibly valuable. So I continue to use it. I continue to go there. You can find me there at Econ Talker, E-C-O-N-T-A-L-K-E-R. And you can find Megan there at, I think, Asymmetric Info, correct? That is correct. And I think it's a wonderful source of information. But I think um, the norms that are there, uh, I think I want to urge humility, patience, and kindness. And I know that's treacly and um, – Idealistic, but I think every single one of us has control over those things. We don't have to wait for a new president, a new government, a new world order, a policy, a law. Everybody has control over those things that I encourage everyone to behave that way. Your turn. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I no, we, kindness overrated. No, I, I, I think that all of those things, you know, I slip, I, I am sarcastic, I sometimes respond in kind. But I also have my moments in which I think of myself as the troll whisperer, where I try to say, um, you know, and it sort of depends on the troll. But frequently, if someone seems like they're open to argument, I'll say, like, look, I think you misunderstood me. That wasn't quite what I was trying to say. Um, I think we actually have a lot of common ground here because we do, guys. We agree with each other about more stuff than we don't. We're all basically nice people. Um, I know this makes me sound again, Pollyanna, um, but I, I do did like mine. your turn. Yeah. I, I think most people are like basically nice, decent people who want the world to be a better place. And they have all sorts of other human, less lovely attributes. They can be callous. They can be, I, I include this in myself. I have all the same flaws as everyone else, right? We can be callous, uh, towards others, um, who those others are can differ, but you know, we, it was the Adam Smith line that uh, an earthquake in China interests us less than like a cut we got on our little finger. Um, that we can be unkind. We get angry. We say things we don't mean. We want to hurt people. Those are all normal human things. Um, we enjoy watching other people get hurt. Other people hurt other people. Uh, if those other people we perceive as our enemies, uh, whether those people are opposing football teams or whether they are people on Twitter who are getting dressed down by someone on your side. We, those are human, normal human things. But the fact is a better life, an actual better life, a happier life for you um, comes from embracing the positive side and not the dark side. And in fact, also a better society comes out of that is that we get we get a lot farther, yes, Debate should be rigorous. I'm not against the the sly joke and all the rest of it. Um, debate should be absolutely rigorous and vigorous, which was the word I had meant to use. Again, I played middle age. Um, but that in the end, I, I've, t- I've written, I wrote a column about the fact that America is like a marriage. It's like a marriage in a country with no divorce, right? You, you cannot win a marriage. You can only win something that ends before you do. And so you can't just beat the other 50% of the population. They're here. You've got to figure out a way to live with them. And you can, you know, if we want, we can have a bad marriage. There were lots of them around before divorce was legal. There are still some around now. We can have a terrible marriage where we scream at each other and we're bitter. We say nasty things to each other all the time. But you don't win that. You lose that. Because now you're in a miserable marriage and the other person has just as much power to hurt you as you have to hurt them. And that is, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, the lesson of Trump is yeah. that people and, and you know, you can also say like the, the lesson of, of gay marriage where social conservatives turned around and said, why is everyone beating me up? And it's like, well, these people felt like you were beating them up for a long time. That's why. That's the problem. Um, and that like we have to recognize that there is the other population is not going away. 
And that if you want to live with them without them constantly hurting you, you have to not look to constantly hurt them, no matter how, and right in a marriage, any marriage, no matter how good, has grievances yep. <laughs> built up for sure. a long time. Everyone's been, everyone who's been married for a while has been in that fight. It's like, remember six years ago when you... Um, You're the only one, Megan. No, I... <laughs> I have a good marriage. <laughs> I love my husband. Um, but you or with your siblings, right? Remember when you were six and mom did X? Um, it's not that you don't have real grievances. You do. But the, if the grievances dominate everything that you think about the other side, you are making yourself unhappy. Every time you hit them, you are ensuring that they will hit back and that you will be more unhappy. And that is the, we've got to get beyond this. I mean, you know, we, we never did perfectly, but we lived together more civilly 20 years ago or 50 years ago. It was not a perfect society. There were many people who were oppressed. I don't want to go back to that period, but I don't actually, and again, maybe this is Pollyanna. I don't think we have to go back to Jim Crow to go back to a period in which people could recognize that most of their neighbors were decent people, regardless of what their politics were. Yeah. who deserved respect regardless of what their politics were. I don't think that we need to go back, we need to have all of the bad things the 50s to have a certain amount of national unity and national comedy. Um, that's C-O-M-I-T-Y. comedy. C-O-M-I-T-Y. Yes. Yeah. I, got you. <laughs> I, I heard that. I just have to say one thing. It was beautifully said. I just say one thing, um, being the representative of Adam Smith that he can talk, and it's it's interesting. You, you, talked, you gave his example of the earthquake in the finger. He says that... Uh, he actually talks about a surgery on your finger. If you're going to lose your little finger, uh, you're going to sleep badly. Whereas if you hear that a million people are killed in an earthquake in China, you, you're going to be a, you, know, you might be a little bit upset, but you're you're still going to sleep that night. And I think that's true even today with the internet. Um, the tragedies we're in the middle of right now of Hurricane Harvey and Irma, horrible, horrible things happening to human beings. Even if you watch them on TV or on the internet. Uh, you probably care more about your own personal well-being because that's the way we're wired. What Smith went on to say, and this is, I think, the a nice way to end our conversation, what Smith went on to say is that, so why is it then that if you have a chance to save your finger uh, by killing a million people, you wouldn't think about doing that for a second? No one could be that monstrous because you've already revealed that you care more about your little finger in some fundamental sense than you do about the lives of strangers, and yet we don't behave that way. And his answer, of course, was that social norms develop that prevent us from being monsters, even though in our heart we have some darkness, we have a minimal, uh, we don't have as much benevolence as we'd like to, as we'd like us perhaps to have. That just isn't the way the world is. So while people may be basically nice, um, benevolence is a higher standard, and Somehow, we act frequently benevolently, even though our natural impulse is to look out for a finger. Um, and we see this right now. It's a very inspiring thing. The people who've freely chosen voluntarily to go save lives, spend money, and help other human beings when they don't have to is um, one of the glorious things about being a human being. So I like to think we can develop those social norms that at the right level, but uh, we're struggling right now. Yep. I'm not going to try to top Adam Smith. That's exactly right. <laughs> human, human beings can be monstrous, but we can also be glorious. And we can choose, we have done, if you look at society, like there's stuff wrong with it, but there's a lot right about it. And we have chosen those right things. We have chosen to be decent to each other. We can choose to be decent to each other more often, to assume ignorance rather than malice, and to assume decency and respect for, for every person in society, not just the people who you happen to think of as your tribe. My guest today has been Megan McArdle. Megan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks for having me as always. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.